Well, we're going to endeavor to answer that question. Um, we're going to jump into our Bibles now, all right? And that's why you're here. You look like a hungry bunch. So um, we're going to do that. We're going to jump into the Bible. Uh, before I do that, I'd like to uh, take a few moments. I know that I know what I'm about to say, and you don't. <laughs> and, uh, but because of that, I know that it's heavy, and I know that it's going to possibly meet some, um, some stubborn, uh, rebellious, maybe a heart that's a little bit hard. I know that's none of you. You're all so ready to receive. Um, but I understand the need uh, for the Lord to soften the heart, to prepare us, to help us to, do, to have the uh, ability to, to, to want what he wants. Uh, the Bible is an entire book of things we don't want. Do you understand, right? It's hard. And so I understand what's coming and for this next hour. And, and so I understand that there's a need for the Holy Spirit to work here before it's a preemptive strike. He needs to do something now. So if you would please, uh, if you desire to actually make this night profitable, that you desire to, to have this night make a difference and that it was not a waste to come to church, I would ask that you'd bow your heads and pray with me. Um, Father, I, uh, like I said, I, I know what you've shared with me and, and I know that... Um, I know I don't even like to hear this, <laughs> and, but yet you've charged me to, to, to proclaim it publicly and boldly, and so um, give me the grace to do so in a way that, that um, displays your heart in the matter. Um, help us all to have that soft heart to receive truth. Uh, Lord, I understand all of us do that, that the Bible is filled with things that, that, that kind of rub us the wrong way. They go against the grain. It's not the way we are. And so when we read it, we don't want to hear it. And we certainly don't want to do it, Lord. But your promise is that all things work out for the good to those who not only love you, but who are called to your purpose. So if we will do what you've asked us to do, it's not to cause us pain, it's to... Uh, give blessing. That's what you want. And so, Lord, I pray that you would help us to have hearts to receive, ears to hear, and a will to obey. Lord, I also want to lift up our dear, dear friend, uh, Gabe, who uh, we all love so very much. And um, thank you, Lord, for the successful surgery on his hips, for sure. Uh, but back in the hospital again, uh, for some stomach issues and, and, and all. And uh, Lord, uh, so we just lift him up to you. We pray that you will solve that problem in him and allow him to come home soon. And uh, we also ask that you would bless Mary, uh, who's there ministering to her son and loving on him and caring for him. And uh, she needs supernatural energy, Lord, to be able to, I mean, she's a superwoman to begin with, Lord, but she needs a little extra dose of your awesomeness to get through this time. So, Lord, I pray that you would be there with them in a very, very, very present way, just noticeable, tangible way in the hospital with them as they go through this process. We thank you for that, Lord. So again, Lord, open up our heart right now. We bow before you, submitting to your word right now. If you would submit to his word, not, don't just phone this in, but if you would truly submit right now your will to the fathers, say amen. amen. All right. So we got some willing participants. So um, I've had a uh, crazy week in, uh, in advance of coming to hang out with you guys tonight, uh, got to drive up to uh, Fort Jackson in South Carolina to see uh, my son, my stepson, my son Blair, um, who looks like he's 12, but he's actually graduated Army basic training. And so we went up there to see him, and we watched 1,100 uh, young men and women out there in this field. I can't believe they have machine guns, honest to goodness. Like, they look like they're in diapers. It's crazy. I guess I'm just getting old, you know? Um, there was a day I looked at those guys and go, man, they're tough looking dudes, right? And I'm like, they're going to do what? <laughs> it's crazy. But anyway, it was good. We went up there. We, we saw him and uh, congratulated him. And then we went 
over to Greenville, where our family lives, and uh, we get to hang out with our awesome family in Greenville. And um, so I drove up on Wednesday, left here Wednesday evening at about 6.30, 6.45, Went home, tried to sleep a little bit, but my mom and my sister and her husband and their kids were all at my house visiting, and, and, and so I couldn't sleep. It was the last chance I had to hang out with my mom, so I had to be a good... You gave a, you gave a Jewish word, a Yiddish word earlier. You said satskis. Didn't you say satskis? That's like very... Didn't you say a satski at the house? Didn't... <laughs> A tchotchke. So, yeah, that's, a, that's very Yiddish. That was good. So I'm, I want to help. I want to do that. I want to jump on that bandwagon. I want to say I was being a good boy chickle. Okay? I was being a good boy chickle, and I was trying to be a good boy chickle and hang out with my mom, and, and so I did, and uh, so no sleep, and at 11 o'clock, I jumped in my car, and I drove up to, uh, to Fort Jackson and uh, fell asleep in some parking lot somewhere for about an hour and a half, did an hour and a half of sleep, went to this graduation, got there a couple minutes late. This tough, this tough looking soldier was standing there going, you ain't sitting up there in the grandstand. I'm like, yeah, but my wife saved me a seat. I don't care. You're going down there. I was like, yes, sir. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's cool. Like, and uh, so I had to go stand where I couldn't see anything. And it just totally sucked, you know, but whatever. So we get done. We drove to Greenville. You guys remember Moses, right, in the Bible? Remember when he made a way, when God made a way? You know what I'm talking about. I posted it online today, and everyone, I, I said, he made a way. And everyone was like, give me the super holy answers, like, amen, yes, indeed, he has made a way, you know? It was just awesome, and he has, right? That's not what I was talking about. But, but he made a way in the Red Sea, right? Remember when Moses is like walking through the Red Sea with, with, with Israel, and it's like dry land, and there's water over here, and there's water over here, and they're just walking through, and he made a way when there was no way, right? So I'm driving home last night, and the trap, I, listen, I couldn't have timed it better. I hit Atlanta at 4.30 on Friday. <clears throat> yeah, you guys should let me be your leader, man. You're smart. And, and, and so I got to Atlanta, and so I sat in that parking lot for a couple hours. And, and so as I'm approaching, I'm approaching Florida, I'm looking, and, and now it's dark out, right? And there's just crazy lightning over here, and there's crazy lightning over there, right? Bring up that first picture. That was the radar, right? I brought it up. That was the radar. You see hell coming from the left, right? It was crazy. But, but, but it was kind of cool. He made a way, because when I got to the border of Florida, Dude, 75 is like right here, and, and this stuff was moving, and I went right down this little corridor. Man, it was, I wish I had a car. I could have put it on the screen right here. It was awesome. I hardly even got a raindrop. I called Meredith. I'm like, you need to pray for me. I'm going to see the Lord today, and, and, and she, she must have been praying because that's what happens when, when my wife prays, man. She's an amazing woman of faith, but, but man, I went right down that little gray gap right to Tavares, and I hardly got a, a raindrop on my windshield, man. It was a miracle. Praise God he made a way for me. So I'm happy to be here, and I was happy to get here because I have a message for you from the Lord, and I, I know it's going to bless your heart. I know you're going to leave differently. Do me a favor and grab a Bible. Please don't just listen to me. Grab a Bible and turn to Luke chapter 17, and we're going to feast on the first 10 verses of that tonight. As you're turning there, I want to remind you why we've been going through the gospel of Luke for, oh my goodness, a year now or so. And the reason for the Luke study is basically all wrapped up. You heard it in the video. It, it said right there, who is Jesus? It doesn't make any difference what any other decision you make. Like, that's the big thing. Because if you make every decision right in life and make that one wrong, all of it is for nothing. And if you make this one decision correctly, even if everything's a fiasco, if you live with a long view of, of eternity, it's all going to work out well, right? I heard Ed Stetzer at our conference, he said, it's not your best life now. It's your li best life then. And he's right. It's your best life then. We, we're studying through the Gospel of Luke to find out this basic question. Is Jesus the Lord or not? That's it. That's the only reason why we're studying this. We want to know if Jesus is the Lord or not. Now, if you study through the Gospel of Luke as we have, there's only one answer you're going to come up with, and that is a resounding yes, he is Lord. 
Okay, and then when you make that decision that he is the Lord of your life, then it also gives us a life goal, like I'm working towards something. I have to work towards something. Who needs to get up in the morning with some purpose, right? Otherwise, you just don't want to get up. You need to have some purpose when you get up. When your feet hit the floor, it has to be for a reason. And so that's what this is. I've, I've made Jesus the Lord of my life, and now I have a goal with my life. I know where I'm going. So we want to study who he is. We want to know what he really taught, what he really said. And then in some places over the last year, we've kind of discarded some of the junk that people say he said or that he did, but that he didn't really do it or say it. So we're clarifying that. One of the, you know, when you go through books of the Bible as we do here in our church, it's good and bad. It's good because it's, it's, it, it gives you material every single week. Like you don't have to be super smart or super creative to come up with stuff because it's just right there. And so that's kind of nice because it gives you material every week. You'll ne- he'll never let you down. But the bad thing is, is that sometimes the preacher gets to a section and he's like, yeah, I don't want to preach that. And, and there's a lot of reasons why we don't want to preach that. One of the big ones is you read it and you're like, yeah, I'm not good at that at all. And I have no right to tell you what you should do when I can't get there. It's hard. Now, I understand the word of God is the word of God. Whether I'm succeeding at that or not, it's still the word of God. And I still have the responsibility to preach it. But when you're, when you're not doing well at something and you read it, you're like, yeah, I'm a bust in that. So who am I to get up and tell you to be doing something. So that's just an internal battle, and the preacher has to get over it. Sometimes you don't want to preach it because you know your congregation well, and you're, and you're about, and you get to a section, you're like, oh, I hope he doesn't show up tonight, please. You know, I, you know, it's always the, the, the week that someone, this thing needs to go, it's driving me insane. Uh, it's always the week that, wow, I don't even know how you did this. Okay, so it's always the week that someone comes up to you, and, and, and if they do this, please don't, don't ever do this again. Um, hey, my friend's coming. I invited them, and they left their, the last 17 churches because they, they don't like when the church talks about money. And it just so happens that that week, you're in the section, right, that you've made a commitment to your church. I will preach no matter what. Here it is. And whammo, it's about giving. Or, or hey, my friends are coming. And, and pardon me, but uh, there's some young people, but they're, there's, there's lesbi- they're lesbians. And wouldn't you know it, I'm right there in the text where it talks about homosexuality. And it's like, oh, man, are you kidding me? They finally came. Right? Yeah, he finally came. So, so sometimes you don't want to preach because you know, right, sometimes it reads your mail. Anyone ever been in church and you, and you got your mail read and you think, like, I had something to do with it? I got nothing to do with it. I had nothing to do with it, right? I, I'll just tell you right now, I'm not that good at all. And God is good. And he knows exactly what you need, when you need it. So sometimes God reads your mail. And sometimes you come in and the preacher's preaching about something. It's okay, you're good, you're good. Sometimes you're preaching about something and you know it has nothing to do with you. Did you, ever hear, did you ever come to church and they're preaching about something you're like, yeah, they're teaching about parenting and I'm 13 years old. Like, what do I, what do I need to even hear this for, right? They're teaching about, about whatever, just put the subject and it has nothing to do with you, right? Those weeks stink. But when you're committed to the text, and you want to honor the Lord, and you want to teach the full counsel of God, you preach it no matter what. And you trust the Holy Spirit to go forth with that word and hit the people the way they need to be, and it's going to be effective, and it's going to grow, and it's going to produce fruit. And you know what? It always does. And so we need to not have fear, but sometimes it's not a whole lot of fun. But I'm excited because this one's for all of us. I know this one's for all of us. This one was for me. This one's for you. It's for every single person in this room, whether you're young, old, man, woman. Everyone needs to hear this. This is a message from God to who? Me. Say me. This is for me. This is for me. Okay. I'm going to do this. Awesome. 
There we go. I don't want to trip over it because I know I'm going down. I mean, I just thought that's all there is to it. I'm going down. Y'all going to laugh at me. It's on Facebook. My wife's watching. She thinks I'm masculine. I'm going off the stage. I'm going to keep it that way. Okay. All right, let's read chapter 17 of, of Luke, okay? First 10 verses. Are you guys, are you there? Does God have your attention? You're off your phones, right? You got your notebooks open. You got your pens in your hand. You got your Bibles open. And you're looking at, at Luke chapter 17, verse 1. Ready? All right, let's do this. One day Jesus said to his disciples, there will always be temptations to sin. But what sorrow awaits the person who does the tempting? I wasn't faithful to the text there. I, let, me, let me do that sentence again because you see there's an exclamation point. One day Jesus said to his disciples, there will always be temptations to sin, but what sorrow awaits the person who does the tempting? It would be better to be thrown into the sea with a millstone around your neck than to cause one of these little ones to fall into sin. So watch yourselves. All of a sudden Jesus doesn't look like the Sunday school picture anymore, does he? If another believer sins, rebuke that person. Then if there's repentance, forgive. Even if that person wrongs you seven times a day and each time turns again and asks for forgiveness, you must forgive. The apostles said to the Lord, show us how to increase our faith. The Lord answered, if you had faith even as small as a mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, may you be uprooted and be planted in the sea and it would obey you. When a servant comes in from plowing or taking care of sheep, does his master say, come in and eat with me? No. He says, prepare my meal. Put on your apron and serve me while I eat. Then you can eat later. And does the master thank the servant for doing what he was told to do? Of course not. In the same way, when you obey me, you should say, we are unworthy servants who have simply done our duty. <clears throat> Let's take this apparent ADD section of all over and let's just put this thing together, okay? Because he's talking about a bunch of different things. But it's a one conversation he's having with, some, with these people and it must make sense and it does completely. So if you're a note taker, and I hope that you are, it shows the Lord that you mean business here that you want to learn, you want to grow, jot this down. My actions inspire reactions. My actions, that's huge. My actions inspire reactions. See, 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 a church is going to tell you that it's not about you, and it's not. It's about the Lord, but you're very powerful. You're a powerful person, and the, the things that you do inspire reactions from other people. And it's quite clear here in the text let me just remind you here again, there will always be temptations to sin, but what sorrow awaits the person who does the tempting. You see, there's, 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 an, there's an opportunity right there for you to, to inspire a reaction. And sometimes it will be good, and sometimes it will be bad, but you would inspire a reaction. And that's why the Bible is so very, very clear. All throughout the New Testament, time and time again, God would tell us things like this, Ephesians 4.1, live a life worthy of the calling you received. Colossians 1.10, live a life worthy of the Lord. Philippians 1.27, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. Why? Because your actions inspire reactions. Your actions inspire reactions. Man, he stole my thunder a little bit, but let me just tell you something. Jesus said this too in another way. He said in Acts 1.8, you will be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. When people see you, they're going to see me, hopefully, and your, your life is either going to draw them closer to me or it's going to move them further away from me. You're going to be a witness of something. You're going to tell of something. The apostles said it. How can we not tell of what we've seen and heard? And that should be us. We should be able to tell of Jesus and, and draw people to the Father, like Manny said. He said, your life will inspire reactions. You will be my witness to the ends of the earth. See, the, the Bible is so true. We, we know it's true because it's the word of God. That's a great place for an amen. Hold on, let me back up a little bit. We know that it's true because it's the word of God. Okay, never let that one slip again. That's a good one. We know that it's true because it's the word of God. 
and we know it's true from our experience that all of us fail in many ways. There's not a person on this earth that's got it down pat yet. We're, we're hopefully progressing, but we're not perfect. That's the Christian life, a progressive movement. We're sanctifying. We're, we're being changed from glory to glory every day, something new, something better, conformed into the image of Christ. We're supposed to be different. We all sin. Temptation comes from a million different places. Don't be one of them. Don't be one of them. Don't be the one that causes someone to respond in sin. You know, the great apostle Paul, he, he had this down pat. He fully understood God's heart in this matter of actions, inspiring reactions. Let me ask you, you guys a question. This is, this is kind of a touchy subject, but I'm gonna, this is a good church, and, and, you, and you guys are cool about this. Um, is it okay to drink to drink. Is it okay to have an alcoholic beverage? It is, right? Just in case you don't know, the Bible never forbids having a drink. Now, it does say not to get drunk, okay? But it, it's okay to have a drink, all right? Let me ask you another question. And you vegans in the house might get all offended, but whatever, you'll have to get over it. Is it okay to have a steak? Oh, God, yes, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Amen. Oh, yeah. That's a good amen spot, too. Amen. Right? Rare blood dripping down your goatee and stuff, right? Yeah. 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 What do you, how do you like it? Medium? You'll get saved someday. <clears throat> I love you. Love you. Yeah. It's okay to have a drink. It's okay to have a steak, right? But listen to what Paul says in Romans chapter 14, verse 21. Talking about actions, inspiring reactions. He says, it is better not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything else if it might cause another to stumble. Amen. Right? So, so, so you can have a drink and you can have a steak. And, and I think, I love this, he says, or do anything so if you knew that, that it's okay to have a drink, right? But if, 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 if you having that drink would cause someone else to go get drunk, you shouldn't do it, right? Let me call you, let, no, not me. Let God's word call you to a, a holier place. It says not to do these things if it might do it. It's not just, oh, if it, that guy's, he, he's been in AA for a while, and, and, you, and so we would, don't drink. No. If it might make someone stumble, it's better not to do it. Okay? Is he reading your mail a little bit? You don't have to say anything. If there's anything that you would do that maybe, possibly could be making someone, remember you're a witness, right? So you, is what you do, is it drawing them to Jesus? Or is it, is it maybe, possibly, kind of, could, maybe push them away? We forego our rights, right? Can I do it? Yes. Should I do it? Maybe not. Maybe not. Our attitude should be, I don't have to do this. I don't have to give up my rights. I don't have to forego my desires, but I will to bless others and grow his church. Amen. Well, what's more important? I mean, you, you all know you can have, after your church tonight, you know you could go to whatever restaurant you want and have a glass of wine. You know you can do it. I'm telling you right now, this is, this is kind of bad to say because some, you know, the human race, they take permission and they ruin it, Right? Sex is a beautiful thing, have sex with everyone. Having a drink is a good thing, have a million of them, right? That's what we do. We're broken people, right? So this is dangerous to say, especially like online and all this stuff, but it's okay to have a drink. But, everyone say but. But, but if you go to that restaurant tonight and your, your legal right, your liberty, allows you to have a drink, but it might push someone away from Jesus, you don't do it. You should not, no, I shouldn't tell you not to do it. You should not want to do it. You should not want to do it. 
1 Corinthians 10, 23 would tell us that, that we have the right to do these things, but not all things are helpful, right? Not all things are helpful. In my life, not so much now, because I spend most of my time with you guys, and it doesn't happen too often, but you know, it breaks my heart. I have good friends from in the past that, you know, we would go out drinking all the time, like heavy, and some of us were like really bad addicts. And, and to this day, I still, like, there's some people in that group that I love that are reformed. They're not drinking anymore, which is awesome, right? And, and I still see it, that, that when they go out, my buddies that were part of that group, they still drink in front of him. And I want to punch them in the face. Honest, I mean, I'm not, pray for me. I want to punch them right in the freaking face. Like, why would you do that? The, the guy is like trying, and, 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 and because you know you can, doesn't mean you know you should. Like, have a brain. Have a brain, right? So we don't do these things. You don't have a drink in front of an addict. Listen, you don't do anything that, that's a big word, that might cause someone to stumble, right? All that to say this here, to set up verses three and four. <laughs> Watch yourselves! It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a bold, like it's, this is not Jesus of the Sunday school classroom with his long Fabio hair and his white robe. No, this is, he's, he's serious right now, right? He's serious. Watch yourselves. This is a serious matter. He says, um, if another believer sins, rebuke that person. Then if there is repentance, forgive. Even if that person wrongs you seven times a day, and each time turns again and asks for forgiveness, you, what? Must forgive. You know what's amazing about this section? Like, so you're reading this, right? And here comes Jesus, and he's talking about a believer sinning. And, and, and I could just, I could see, you know, you're in church, and, and, and you get to this part where Jesus is going to confront sin, and you're like, oh, awesome. I got him here this week. He's, Jesus is going to come after him right now. He's going to correct that guy. He's a sinner. He's been misbehaving. Here he comes. But unfortunately, Jesus isn't even talking to that dude. He's talking to you. He's talking to you, right? He's talking to you. Choice time. Ding, 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 ding. You're going to either act like everybody else. You got sinned against. You got wronged. There's an offense. Whatever it is. And you're going to act just like them. Just like the world. You're going to reciprocate. You're going to seek revenge. You're going to, you know, eye for an eye. A tooth for a tooth. Or Romans 12, 2, don't copy the behaviors and customs of this world. And you're going to be like Jesus who forgave the ones who were posting him to the tree. What offense do you have against anyone that's that bad? What offense, what person who has wronged you, that if they could walk into this church and say, I'm sorry to God and seek forgiveness, which one of them would Jesus turn away? None. Why do you? Why do we? Why do I? You see why I don't want to preach this? I do the same thing. <clears throat> see, this is, this is where the rubber meets the road. This is, this is true Christianity. Jesus is clear. He's very, very much into your grill right now. He's personal. It's right in your face. This is for me. This is for me. Be healthy if you said that. It's for me. It's for me. It's not for the guy next to me. It's for me. It's for me. Here's the first thing. This is, this is just for believers. See, we're different. We're different than everybody else. This is for believers. You see, it says it right there. Um, if another believer sins, right? So it's talking about believers. See, believers are different. Uh, Manny mentioned it earlier. If you're in Christ, you're a new creation. You're not really like everybody else now. You're a new creation. You still might be acting a lot like them, but you're not like them anymore. You have been changed at the molecular level. It's no longer your blood going through your veins. It's Christ's blood going through your veins. You're a new creation. And believers are to, according to Ephesians 5.1, imitate God, therefore, in everything, in everything that you do. Everything that you do. And verse 2 says that Christ is your example. 
Is God loving? Is Jesus Christ loving? Is God forgiving? Is Jesus Christ forgiving? Is God patient? Was Jesus Christ patient? Right? If we want to know who God is, you look at Jesus. That's why he came. He came not to, to do anything for himself. He is God no matter what. He came so you could see who God is, so you could imitate him in everything that you do. Let me call you higher and holier than that. John chapter 8, verse 31 says, You are truly my disciple, Jesus says, if you remain faithful to my teaching. Don't be obedient one time and go, oh, I'm good. No, you're not. You must remain faithful to my teaching to be my true disciple. See, we're being called to an extremely holy place. Uh, see, a believer, right, a Christian is not just someone who wears a cross or has a sticker or listens to Chris Tomlin or even goes to church, right? No, they do some things. Christians do some things. Christians act a certain way, right? They're different than everybody else. They do some things. So what do we do now in this context right here in this text? What, how do we, we know how the world responds when someone offends or hurts. We know, right? You fight. You yell, you scream, you get them back, you revenge, you take them out. That's what we do. But what does the Christian do who's a new creation? He's calling you to a holy place here. What do they do? What do you do when someone sins against you? Do, do, we, do, we, do we just lay down and just like kind of let them do it and just like sweep it under the rug? Is that what we're supposed to do? See, the, the problem in the church often is that we get two different messages. You either lay down and you're a doormat and you let them just do whatever they want and you're just supposed to grin and bear it or there's the righteous anger, they'll say, and you, and you know what I'm saying? Like, you gotta get them. No, I did both of those. The Bible here, it says clearly, what do you do? If some other believer sins, rebuke. You rebuke. You know what a rebuke is? A rebuke is a clear and bold disapproval. This is wrong. You don't beat around the bush. You don't sugarcoat it at all. You look the brother in the eye. This is wrong. That's what you do. It's not a condemning. It's not a punishment. It's not an opportunity for a verbal assault. It's no name calling or insulting. You look the brother in the, or the sister in the eye. This is is wrong. You need to stop doing that. That's what you do. That's a rebuke. That's a rebuke. Now, does that mean you're yelling and screaming and no. This is the right way. Just because you're bold and clear and to the point and formal about this, that doesn't mean you're hollering at them and ripping them down like you guys don't do on Facebook, but other churches do, right? But, here, let me, let me give you the biblical process. This is what we do. It's found in Galatians chapter 6, verse 1. Dear brothers and sisters, I love this, dear. Did you, do you feel, do you, do you hear the heart of, of that pastor, of Paul? He's like, dear brothers and sisters. And, and he's inspired by God, so really it's the message from the Lord. He's saying, dear brothers and sisters, the ones that I love, my loved ones, my children, if another believer is overcome with some sin, and it's like some sin, don't you like that? It's like not specific. It's not like it's your sin or whatever your sin is or, or it's specific about your sin. or this. No, It's not like that, right? He doesn't like pick and choose which sin's the worst, which one's going to the six o'clock news, which one we're going to fight against. No, he's just like, listen, if, if, if another brother or sister is kind of caught up and overcome with some sin, whatever it is, you who are godly, I love the, 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 the sarcasm of God, right? Don't you love that? I love this whole, the, the, that spiritual gift of sarcasm is beautiful. Those of you who are godly, right? You know, though, for you guys that think you know what you're doing, because obviously this person, they don't know what they're doing. That's why they're sinning, but you think you're awesome. You, you know what to do, right? We're the Holy Spirit police, all of us, right? So he says, you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path. Now listen, don't you dare be thinking about someone who didn't do that to you. This is completely at you. 
This has nothing to do with the person who's, who, who you know who's, do, who's guilty of this. This is for you. Because if you're in this church, I'm assuming you're kind of godly. You chose to come here on a Saturday night. You're crazy. So you must be somehow somewhat godly, right? So this is to you. If some other brother or sister is overcome with some sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path. And listen, so here's a, here's a, here's a warning coming too. If you're not gentle and you're not humble about it, you know, not like, hey, I'm super godly and you're not and I'm right and you're wrong and I'm telling you what to do. Like, that's what a lot of people do, right? But he says, no, listen, that gently and humbly means, like humble doesn't mean I'm garbage, but it just kind of brings me down to like, let's, let's be level here. Let's be together, right? I'm not over you. You're not over me. We're just brothers. And he says, and be careful because if you don't do that, you might fall into sin. See, because if we start lording over the people and say, hey, you're wrong, and, rah, rah, and we're barking and yelling and condemning and insulting them, guess what? They're, I don't even remember what they're sinning about. You're, you're heavy in sin right now. You're yelling and screaming and cussing them out. That's okay. And all of a sudden, the sin that was committed, we don't even remember that one anymore because the lunatic godly guy is over here just ripping down the other believer. It's just as bad, right? So he says, be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourself. Like, don't be tempted to sin just like your brother or sister did. And the only way to guard from that is humble and gentle. So we're clear, like there's a rebuke. It's a clear, bold, formal, this is wrong. Can I give you a sample? It is just, I just jotted this down as a sample. Oh, good, Carl's here. Now we can, now we can have church. I was wondering, like, it's like, gosh, Carl's not here. Man, I honestly was going to say that earlier. We can't do this if Carl's not here. Here's a sample. I just kind of wrote this down. Listen, again, this is why I don't want to preach certain things because I'm not real good at it either, but I jotted this down, and I'm, I jotted this down in hopes that maybe I could become like this. Brother, I'm not saying I'm an honor student in this area yet. But I love you, and what you did, or what you're doing, is wrong. It violates God's word, and you need to stop. That's it. Gently, humbly, rebu <laughs> refrigerator magnets will be available next week. <laughs> Rebuke delivered, right? That's it. That's what we do. Rebuke has been delivered. Now, there's no assurance of their response either being a good one. And he's not, that's not who Jesus is talking. He's not talking to the sinner. He's talking to you. And there's no assurance that, that it's even going to go well. But he's calling you to that. Gentle, humble, clear, bold, formal. This is wrong. I love you. It violates God's word. Stop. Now what? If there's repentance, you're wrong. You're wrong. If there's repentance, you must. You must. How much, how much option is there? Zero. There's no option. Now, you, you, you might not make Jesus the Lord of your life. And, and you don't have to listen to this. But there's consequences. And he's telling you, you must forgive. And, and so now we're entering into the issue of, of lordship of Christ in your life. You know, there's certain areas of the Bible that are Bible that are so gray and like kind of you know, we read it and you think one way and I kind of think another and do the gifts go on? Are, are they, have they stopped with the apostles? I'm not quite sure. Do we tithe? Do we do, we do offerings? I mean, like there's different things. Like, you know what I'm saying? And, 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 and we can kind of have committees on that, but, but, but there's cer certain times when I love, and I love this because Jesus is super clear. If someone sins against you, which is what? Bad, right? If they repent... You must forgive. 
boom, drop the mic, done, right? There's no wiggle room, it's not a suggestion, it's the lordship of Christ right now in your life. It's on the line. That's it, right? If there's forgiveness, I mean, if there's repentance, you must forgive. Let's talk about forgiveness a little bit. In the New Testament, there's three words that are used that translate forgiveness. They're all basically the same, and it's just, it's basically this. It's, it's I'm going to forsake it. I, I'm just going to, you, you did something right here. You did, there's this train wreck over here in my life that you did, but I'm leaving it right there. I'm done with it. I'm, I'm, no, I'm not hanging on to it anymore. I'm laying it aside. I'm leaving it there. I'm releasing you, right? I'm letting this thing die. I'm letting it go. In the kindness of my heart, I will freely pardon you from the offense. That's what forgiveness is. In our text here, uh, the word that is used that translates forgiveness also includes in its definition to suffer. It's to suffer. It's, it's, it's you did this, but I'll take this. Right? And, and well, that's not very fair, is it? But Jesus, right? But Jesus. And that's who we're here for, but Jesus, right? See, see, see the reason why we're going over this is because the, we talked about this in Chicago, but the long view of church is, is, is transformation. You're coming here each and every week to, to hear something and to change, right? And so that's why it's but Jesus. See, it was unfair. They did this to me, and I'm going to receive it, and I'm going to take it, and I'm okay with it, and I'm not going to hold you to it anymore. I'm releasing you of that debt. The long view is that as you come here every single week and hear these things about Jesus, that there's transformation resulting in conformation. Romans 8, 29, it is God's desire that those, that listen, those he foreknew, this is the Calvinist argument. Let me throw that right out the window for just a moment in this one area. How many people did he foreknow? Everyone. Is there anyone who's ever been born that God didn't know about them? Did anyone sneak in? No one. For those he foreknew, he chose them to become like Jesus. That's the goal, to become like Jesus. <clears throat> so if there's repentance, forgive. That's hard, right? It's hard. When is enough enough? How many times do I have to tolerate this? You know, one of the greatest excuses in all of Christianity, I find, is this, this expression. Use your discernment. <laughs> we don't have discernment. You know what's one of the spiritual gifts? Discernment. You're not everybody gets that. So don't use your discernment. Use the word of God. Right? What should I do here? I don't know. Use your discernment. Well, but it already says what you should do. So what are we discerning? What do you got to discern when it's clear? How many times do I have to, to how many times, Lord, how, how many times can he offend and hurt and, and mistreat and, and abuse? And, and how many times? How about seven times a day? How about seven times a day? If, if repentance is offered, you must forgive. Now let me just sidetrack a little bit. If that means someone's laying their hands to you, if there's immoral handling, we'll leave it there, right? We don't have to be graphic. That doesn't mean you stay there. You can move out of that situation, but that has nothing to do with forgiving. You, right? You can move, but you must forgive. So forgiving someone who sins is hard. I would say this is harder. Seven times a day. And then also I noticed this here too. Put your eyes back on the text. It says, 
Even if that person wrongs you seven times a day and each time turns again and asks forgiveness, you must forgive. <clears throat> when someone does something repeated over and over and over again and they keep saying they're sorry, it doesn't sit well with you, does it? You're like, yeah, quit saying you're sorry, quit doing it, right? I get it, except you're all wrong, and so am I. Because it just said, listen, listen to God's word, not me. It said, if repentance is asked for, you must. Did it, did it, did it say to use your discernment? What did it say? If they ask you, if they say, I'm sorry, forgive me, does it say anything in there of the genuine article at all? No, it doesn't. Because again, this isn't a letter to the person sinning, is it? This is a letter to who? Me. Me. And it says here that, it, in an, I don't want to say it says here because it doesn't say it, but it says each time that person turns again and asks for forgiveness, yeah, you might be irritated, enough's enough, but the word of God says to you, if the person asks for forgiveness, you must forgive. Forgiveness is hard. Seven times a day is harder. This is hardest, right? Is it a wonder why the disciples follow up with this question? Like, this is impossible, Lord. Can you, how do we get more faith? How do we get more faith? Because there's no way, with my, the faith that I have, there's no way I can pull this thing off, Lord. I don't trust you enough that if I do this, it's gonna work out well for me. I need more faith. Does it make sense? Absolutely it makes sense. I need help. I need to trust you more, Lord. I know what you're saying. I've seen you do the miracles. I've heard the preaching with authority. I understand who you are, but I'm really having a hard time with this, and all of us in this room would be right where they are. Would you agree? Absolutely. Lord, how do we have more faith. And Jesus' response really made me stop, stop and think like of the, this whole week in preparation, this is the thing that really stopped me in my tracks and I had to really think like, man, it's like, yeah, that'd be hard, man. I got people in my life, some of you know who, who they are that I have a really, really hard time. And Jesus responds to my question about, yeah, Lord, I know what you want me to do, but I don't want to do it. And he responds with this crazy, crazy answer. He says, if you had faith even as small as a mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, may you be uprooted and be planted in the sea and it would obey you. Like, what? What? How? I need, I need faith to, to be able to forgive this jerk. And you're telling me about a mulberry tree? Like, what even is that? Right? Faith is small as a... So I'm like, I'm, I, obviously, the burden of responsibility isn't on Jesus here. It's on me to understand what he's saying. So, what, what are you... Faith as small as a mustard. Do you know? Do you see that picture? That's a mustard seed. That's a mustard seed. So, with just this itty bitty little bit of faith that you could barely see, I could uproot a tree and say, "Go in the ocean," and it would like. There's. Two billion Christians in this world. And I don't know how many there have been since the beginning. But there's great men and women of God. Guys like the guy who wrote half the New Testament, like the Apostle Paul, Peter, James, Jonathan Edwards, Martin Luther, Billy Graham. I mean, he's incredible, right? Why hasn't that ever happened? Why hasn't it? I've never seen that on the news that someone had enough faith that they just spoke to the tree and it uprooted. You'd think that if it was in the scriptures all this time for thousands of years that amazing men and women of faith and some have been given incredible 
spiritual gifts to perform miracles. Why hasn't anyone done this? Because Jesus is speaking in the spiritual, not in the natural. That's why. See, people, people see what they see, but Jesus uses what we can see so we can understand the things that we can't. Because that's who Jesus is. He's speaking in the spiritual. <laughs> John chapter 4, the lady comes up to, to, well, Jesus goes up to the lady and they're at the well, right? Hot part of the day. It's scorching hot. And he starts talking to her about living water. I'll give you living water. And she's like, oh, great. Give me some water so I don't have to come back to the well and get another drink. And then later on in the same story, his disciples, the guys who you think might get it, they come back and he's like, I got food that you know nothing of. And they're like, did somebody bring him lunch? <laughs> really? In, in, in uh, let me get the reference, John chapter 6, Jesus says, if you want eternal life, you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood. What is this, the cannibal church? Right? How about John chapter 6, verse 35? This might help clarify. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. How many people in this room, I think Manny asked earlier if you're in Christ. Let me see those hands again if you're in Christ. So you've come to him, right? You've come to him. And let me ask you another question. Since you came to him, have you ever been hungry? Come on, you've been hungry. I'm hungry right now. I'm super thirsty right now. Right? Have we been hungry? We're just being truthful in church. We've been hungry and we've been thirsty. Speaking in the spiritual. Because it's obviously not, naturally that's not true. Jesus is speaking in the spiritual. The lesson in all of these spiritual things is that all that the human soul longs for is found in Christ. That's what he's trying to tell us. He's speaking in the spiritual to natural man. And so here's the lesson he's trying to tell us is that faith in Jesus Christ is super powerful. It's super powerful. It's this faith in Christ that took a dead sinner and gave him new life, Ephesians 2.8. You were saved by grace through faith. And, it's, and here's the other thing too. The book of Romans would tell us that this faith that you have, that was a gift from God. You didn't muster it up at all. It was given to you from him. And so Jesus, listen, you're asking me to do something super hard, man, to always forgive all the time, every time? That's super hard. Or is it simply what a man thinks in his heart? So he is. Think about it. Is it really hard? Is it super hard to do what he's asking you to do? Or is it just um, what a man thinks so he is? I offer this for your consideration that maybe forgiveness is hard only because we have built a strong wall around it and the bricks are made out of our cultural expectations and our past and our emotions and, and peer pressure, people telling you what you should do. If I hear one more person who's going through a divorce, if I hear one more Christian go online and tell that person you should do this, you should leave him and go find this because it's all that matters is you're happy. I'm gonna go through that stinking computer and I'm gonna strangle that person. Don't you dare copy the behaviors and customs of the world. You've been changed. You don't do what everybody else does. Cowards run. Cowards run. And, and maybe it's so hard to forgive because of this self. Listen, perhaps you can't forgive. Perhaps your inability to forgive is a self-imposed prison. Maybe it's not so hard to forgive. Maybe it's so hard to forgive because of this wall that you've put up around it. Instead of tapping into Jesus and his power. 
See, if a little itty bitty faith like a mustard seed could spiritually move a tree, like do something so massive, well, if you're a believer, and this is only for believers like we saw, then you, you got way more than a tiny mustard seed. Right? Your faith didn't move a tree, it resurrected a dead person. So your faith is way more than this little itty bitty little faith that could move a tree. Jesus is saying, you've got more than that. It's not that hard. It's not that hard. Jesus would tell you, if your faith can save you, then your faith can empower you to forgive. Well, you don't know what he, what he did or she did. Jesus knows what you did. Well, you don't know how many times he's done this. I'm not a doormat to be walked on. Can I remind you of the cross? You must forgive. And Jesus goes on here in our text in verses 7 through 10 to lessen the power of the I can't do this thing by lowering the standard of who's actually able to pull this thing off. You see here, when a servant comes in from plowing or taking care of sheep, does his master say, come in and eat with me? No. He says, prepare my meal, put on your apron, serve me while I eat. Then you can eat later. And does the master thank the person for doing what he was told to do? Of course not. In the same way, when you obey me, what, and, and let's just pause there for a second. Obey me to do what? Huh? Specific, this text. Forgive, right? When you obey me, when I, I told you to forgive, when you forgive and you pull it off, you should simply say, I am an unworthy servant doing my duty. That's all. That's all I'm doing. I'm just a regular guy doing a regular thing that everybody can pull off. This is not reserved for the elite of the faith. There's no such thing as the elite of the faith, first and foremost, okay? You need to take that, that lie that you've built up around your heart about that I can't do this, and you need to roll down the window of your car, crinkle it up, and chuck it out the window because it's garbage, right? That's what it is. Jesus said you must, and he gave you the same spirit in you that raised him from the dead. And so we're able to do this. And there's no uh, amazing rewards here. Like, oh, well, if, if this guy does it, he gets this awesome reward because he pulled, like, when, you, when you get an awesome reward, it's because you pulled off something incredible, right? If you, if you, if you are in, a, in an event and you, and you win or, 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 or you come in like third, they give you a little trophy, right? But like if it's a big deal and you like win the Boston Marathon, you get a big prize. Where's the big prize here? There's no big prize. There's no big prize at all. He says there's no reward. There's no reward for this. It wasn't something awesome that you pulled off. I'm telling you, all of you can do this. That's what he's telling us. He's lowering the standard of who can do this. We're just unworthy servants doing my duty. I didn't pull off something awesome and incredible because you offended me and I forgave you. Oh, look at him. How does he do that? Because this, right, this is what Christians do. This isn't some supernatural awesome, oh, look, Ricky can be so forgiving. Shame on us if he's so forgiving compared to the rest of us, right? We should all be this. That's what the word of God would say. It's not something awesome. It's not something you should be uh, rewarded for. Does the master like have a big party for you because you pulled off forgiveness? What does it say? No, you're just an unworthy servant doing your duty. Plain Jane. You ready to sing to the Lord? Amen. All right, band, come on up here. Let's finish up. All this, this whole, this whole section of scripture here in Luke 17, it's all wrapped together in this text to say that since our actions inspire reactions, right? If we don't forgive, we can easily push another into deeper sin. You see? Are you following me? If we don't, 
If we don't act the right way, we could push the one. Pay attention here. Don't pay attention to them. Pay attention to the word of God. If, if we don't do the right thing, then we would inspire reactions that would, that would push the other person into deeper sin. And if we don't humbly and gently rebuke and restore the fellowship that sin strained, then the one who sinned originally certainly didn't witness Jesus. And because I did not forgive as I should have, then the one who initially sinned might easily slip into deeper bitterness and anger and gossip and slander. Listen, I say it often. Take the nails. Take the nails. You know, you know as well as I do that the world expects something of you. When, when you go around and you say you're a Christian, they expect something of you. And we are not here to people please by any means. But if we don't act the right way and do what it says by forgiving, even if they sin against you seven times a day and each time say, I'm sorry, please forgive me. If you don't, what will they do? They'll go right on Facebook. They'll go right to all their buddies and they will tell the world how awful you are. Bottom line, right? And listen, and even then, we can't hold them, we can't hold them to a standard because the unspiritual mind, the one who doesn't have the mind of Christ, the one who doesn't have the Holy Spirit living inside of them, they don't know what to do. But you do. And so you're held to a much higher standard than they would be. So I, tell, I encourage you, please, to take the nails. Listen, the future of your family and the future of your church family, it rests solely on this, on forgiveness. I mean, it, isn't that the gospel? Isn't the gospel just simply forgiveness, right? It's, the, it's forgiveness. And so we are to imitate God in everything we do. And so since, since temptation to sin is everywhere, I would just tell you this, brothers and sisters, uh, don't be that guy. And don't be that girl that would cause somebody to sin. Amen? And pray with me. And then we're going to sing to the Lord. Remember what we taught last week? Who remembers last week? Stand. He wants holy hands lifted high. Amen, amen. Exclamation marks, right? Enthusiastic response worshiping the Lord because he's worthy of the air that's coming out of your lungs. He gave it to you. Let's give him, let's leave it all on the field. You want to do that with me? I'm going to sing my stinking guts out over there. <laughs> let's pray. Father, I, uh, I thank you for the clear message of scripture. I thank you, Lord, that that these people right here in this room, including myself, have changed right now because faith comes from hearing the word of God. And so our faith has been increased tonight. And that is a gift from you, Father. And we thank you right now, all of us, we thank you for the increase in our faith that we've received from heaven's throne tonight, Lord. And so in response to that, Lord, we want to worship you and thank you in our, with our voices and with our bodies, with our hands lifted high. We want to thank you for the gift of increased faith tonight. Help us, Lord, to, to be just like you, to forgive, to, to forgive, Lord, to set aside the offense, to leave it right where it is and leave it as dead, that no longer will we carry these offenses. Love does not keep a record of wrongs. And so, Lord, help us to be obedient to your word tonight. You said, if repentance is offered, we must forgive. Help us to do that, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen? Amen. amen. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Love you.